48-year-old cameraman Patrick McDermott was the on-and-off boyfriend of Olivia Newton-John. In 2005, he boarded an overnight fishing charter off the coast of Los Angeles. When the boat disembarked the following day, Patrick was nowhere to be seen. In season two of Suicide, Poppy Damon and Alice Fiennes dig deeper into Patrick McDermott's case than anyone has before to answer the question, did Patrick die at sea? or did he disappear deliberately to begin a new life? Suicide Season 2 is out now, available for free only on Spotify. Stay tuned to the end of today's episode to hear the trailer. We all know how important it is to get a good night's sleep. If you've been tossing and turning for a while, maybe it's time to consider getting a new mattress. Emma Sleep Mattress combines world-class German engineering, UK and Ireland manufacturing, and the latest advancement in foam and spring technology to bring you the best sleep you've had in ages. But don't just take our word for it. Emma Sleep is the UK's most awarded sleep brand and the world's most sold bed-in-a-box brand. Emma Sleep doesn't just do mattresses. They also offer bed frames, pillows, mattress toppers, protectors, duvets, and more. With free shipping and returns and a 10-year warranty, you really have nothing to lose by trying them for yourself. Emma offers plenty of discounts as well, and you can get an extra 5% off by going to www.emmamattress.co.uk slash casefile. Find your best sleep with Emma products and test them out for up to 200 nights risk-free. Save 5% on top of all offers at www.emmamattress.co.uk slash casefile. Our episodes deal with serious and often distressing incidents. If you feel at any time you need support, please contact your local crisis centre. For suggested phone numbers for confidential support, please see the show notes for this episode on your app or on our website. Life in the waterfront city of Tampa, Florida was peaceful for 47-year-old Joanne Steffi. Her bungalow-style house backed onto a man-made canal that granted access to the sparkling blue waters of Tampa Bay. Small boats headed to and from the harbour putted past Joanne's home, creating a relaxing coastal-like environment. Florida's warmth and sunshine added to the appealing atmosphere. In December 1988, A house for sale two doors down from Joanne's was purchased by a couple with a young daughter. In a street where residents knew one another and rarely moved, the new neighbours caused a stir. While the woman and child were rarely seen, the man of the house was seemingly always outside. He was big and burly with a friendly and chatty disposition. He encouraged people to call him Obi, after Obi-Wan Kenobi, a mentor-type character from the popular sci-fi film Star Wars. With his laid-back attitude, casual attire and blue and white powerboat, Obi fit right in. In time, the novelty of his family's arrival died down and they blended into the neighbourhood. There was just one problem. Obi gave Joanne Steffi the creeps. She found his banter superficial and fake, and he had a tendency to appear out of nowhere and insert himself into private conversations. Joanne had also developed a hunch that he was hiding something. She aired her suspicions to another neighbour, but they considered Obi harmless. Nevertheless, Joanne took to avoiding Obi whenever possible. On a late Saturday night in early 1990, Joanne was in her kitchen when she glanced outside. A large figure was loitering in the glow of a streetlight close to Joanne's front door. It was Obi. 
He looked to be staring intently at Joanne's house. Joanne turned off the lights to give the impression she was going to bed, then positioned herself by a window. She peered out. Obi remained put, his attention transfixed on Joanne's home. Five minutes ticked by before he finally moved, as if awoken from a spell. He called out something and a little white dog ran up to his feet. Obi then wandered off in the direction of his home. The Rogers family worked hard on their dairy farm in the small village of Wilshire, Ohio. 37-year-old patriarch Hal Rogers maintained the 300-acre property full-time. Hal's 36-year-old wife, Joan, better known as Jo, helped out. Jo also worked nights as a forklift operator. Even the couple's two teenage daughters chipped in. 17-year-old Michelle and 14-year-old Christy Rogers juggled their schoolwork with farm chores. When it came time for the family to take a much-needed break, they excitedly began planning a trip to Florida. The southern coast, with its hundreds of miles of beaches and festive atmosphere, offered a welcome change to the Rogers' inland rural lifestyle. Importantly, Florida was the home of the Disney World theme park and resort. While Hal and Joe had been on a few interstate trips throughout their long relationship, visiting Florida would mark the first time Michelle and Christy had left Ohio. Michelle eagerly crossed off each passing day on her calendar until her long-awaited holiday finally commenced on Friday, May 26, 1989. Hal wished he could go to Florida, but his farm needed constant upkeep, so he decided to stay home. At 1.30pm, he bid Joe, Michelle and Christy farewell. The women piled into the family car, a two-door blue Oldsmobile Calais. Joe drove down the dirt driveway headed for Interstate 75. The highway would take them over 1,000 miles south through the streets of Kentucky, Tennessee and Georgia before reaching Florida. The trio were due back on Sunday, June 4 at the latest, as Joe had to work on Monday night. Days into their trip, Howe received a postcard from Florida's central city, Orlando. It contained a message penned by Joe that read, Leaving for Disney World for three nights. Weather is hot and humidity is very high. Kids having a great time, dragging me everywhere. Better go, have to get Christy out of bed. Love you, take care. Don't work too hard. When Sunday June 4 arrived, Hal expected the Oldsmobile to pull up at any moment. Yet, the day wore on with no sign of his family. When Joe and the girls hadn't returned by nightfall, Howe began ringing around to see if someone else had heard from them. He discovered that Michelle had called her boyfriend three days earlier on Thursday, June 1. The 10-minute call took place at around lunchtime and had originated from a hotel room in the city of Tampa. Michelle had gushed to her boyfriend about how much fun she was having. The only bad thing she had to say was that she and Christy wanted to go into the ocean, but their mother wouldn't let them because they couldn't swim. Hal Rogers went to bed that night concerned, but told himself that Joe and the girls had probably just extended their holiday for another night. Perhaps they had found an interesting place to stay on the way home. Hal was certain they would reunite on Monday. 
Meanwhile, in Tampa, police were working diligently into the night following a disturbing discovery. Earlier that day, the Coast Guard had received a frantic radio call from a man on a sailboat in Tampa Bay. He had sighted something floating in the water and had moved in for a closer look. It was the lifeless body of a woman. Attempts to lift the body out of the water were hampered by a heavy object that was attached to the woman's neck via a thin yellow rope. After struggling to retrieve the body for 30 minutes, the Coast Guard had no choice but to cut the rope. The weight that anchored the body sank to the depths, allowing responders to lift the woman's body out with ease. She was naked from the waist down. Her ankles and wrists were hogtied with rope. Duct tape had been placed over her mouth. Realising the gravity of the situation, the Coast Guard alerted the police who organised to meet them at the shore. Within minutes of having retrieved this body, the Coast Guard received another emergency call. A second body had been spotted by a boat off four miles away. It was another woman. She was also partially naked, hogtied and gagged with duct tape. The victim had managed to free one of her hands and looked to have tried to remove the tape covering her mouth. There was also a thin yellow rope around her neck. It was tied to a heavy cinder block that responders were able to recover with the body. Just as the Coast Guard was travelling back to shore to meet with police, a third woman's body was found in the bay, two miles from the second. The victims presented the same way, making it clear that their murders were connected. They had been in the water for about two days, which had expedited decomposition and washed away key evidence. The fact that all three were found naked from the waist down indicated that the crime was sexually motivated. Tidal analysis confirmed the women had entered the water from a boat, as they wouldn't have reached deep water in their condition from a bridge or the shoreline. The cinder blocks tied to their necks were a deliberate act to weigh their bodies down. None of the bodies had knife or bullet wounds or anything else to indicate a violent cause of death. This led a medical examiner to assume that they had entered the water while still alive. It could not be ascertained if the women had died from strangulation or drowning. Their official cause of death was listed as asphyxia. No identification was found with the victims. Their fingerprints were taken, but they didn't match any on record. Scouring Tampa Bay for evidence came up dry. When speaking to the press, authorities were up front. They had no motive, no suspects, and no leads. No one matching the victim's descriptions had been reported missing in the area recently. This led police to believe that the women were from elsewhere. Florida was a tourist hotspot, especially in the warmer months. A memo was sent to local hotel owners to be on the lookout for any female guests who had failed to check out. Four days after the bodies were discovered, a housekeeper was going about her workday. She was employed at the Days Inn, a hotel in the Bayside Tampa neighbourhood of Rocky Point. She entered room 251. The two double beds within were neatly made. Makeup and toiletries were on the bathroom counter and clothing was scattered on the dark teal carpet. The hotel room had appeared exactly the same for the previous four days. The housekeeper informed her manager. The guests assigned to room 251 hadn't checked out yet. Their booking was under the name Rogers and applied to Joe Rogers and her two daughters, Michelle and Christy. They had checked into the room at midday on Thursday, June 1 
and hadn't been seen since. Homicide detectives were informed and arrived at the hotel room where they recovered Joe, Michelle and Christie's fingerprints. They were cross-checked with the three bodies found in nearby Tampa Bay. The missing women's dental records were also obtained to facilitate an ID check. There was absolutely no doubt. The three murdered women were Joe, Michelle and Christy Rogers. There were no signs of a struggle in the Rogers hotel room or anything else distinctly criminal. A roll of camera film was taken into evidence and developed. The second last photo depicted Michelle Rogers sitting on the hotel room's floor. Although sunburned and weary, she did not appear distressed. The photo was taken the day the group had checked in. The final photo was taken from the hotel room's balcony of the sun setting over Tampa Bay. This meant the three women had been in their hotel room at dusk on Thursday, June 1. It was unknown where they had gone from there. Notably, the Rogers Blue Oldsmobile wasn't in the hotel parking lot. The search for the car encompassed the nearby perimeter of Tampa Bay, given its significance. It was soon discovered in a parking spot at a boat landing closest to the Days Inn. There was nothing to suggest anything amiss had occurred in relation to the vehicle, and only Joe, Michelle and Christie's fingerprints were found in and around it. The Oldsmobile contained a book of semi-complete crossword puzzles, a half-eaten chocolate bar, two decks of playing cards, and a brochure with directions to the Days Inn scribbled on it. There was also a piece of paper in the front that featured Joe Rogers' handwriting. She had jotted down the directions to the boat ramp where her car was found and the words, blue with white. Curiously, a blue and white coloured powerboat was sighted in the car park of the Days Inn on the very day Joe and the girls went missing. The witness recalled the boat was being towed by a dark coloured car. This looked to be a promising lead. However, blue and white were common boat colours. Without anything to help detectives narrow in on this potential clue, it hit a dead end. In the initial stages of their investigation, detectives received close to 1,000 tips. All were looked into, but none led to the killer or killers. One detective told the Cincinnati Post newspaper that they were putting all their effort into the case because, quote, Everyone's been shocked by this, even among cops. You've got a whole family wiped out, practically. Back in Ohio, Hal Rogers was at a loss. Joe, Michelle and Christy were missing. He had initially convinced himself that they were held up sightseeing. But once Joe skipped work, Hal knew something was wrong. He phoned the local police and highway patrol to inform them of the situation. At one stage, he was asked by police to provide his wife and children's dental records. He agreed, though wasn't quite sure why they were needed. By Friday, June 9, it had been 14 days since Hal had seen Joe and the girls. That day, an unfamiliar car rolled down his driveway. A man got out. He said he worked for a newspaper, then asked Hal for a comment on the drowning murders of Joe, Michelle and Christy. It was the first Hal had heard of it. He spent the day carrying out his farm work in shock, not knowing what else to do. He blamed himself for what happened, believing that if he had gone on the Florida trip, then his wife and daughters would still be alive. A joint funeral service was held for Joe, Michelle and Christy Rogers. Over 300 Wilshire locals attended, a significant crowd considering the population wasn't much higher. Joe was remembered as a hard-working woman. 
Michelle was intelligent and modest. Christy was bubbly and sociable. As the Wilshire community grieved, homicide detectives arrived in town. They had come to suspect that the answers they sought weren't in Florida, but closer to home. Case File will be back shortly. Thank you for supporting us by listening to this episode's sponsors. Did you know that over the holidays, property crimes like burglaries and package thefts spike nationally? That's why our friends at Simply Safe Home Security are offering 50% off their award winning security system so that more families can feel safe and secure this holiday season. Order your Simply Safe system for half off and enjoy advanced security and greater peace of mind this holiday season. Simply Safe has been named the best home security system of 2022 by US News and World Report, making it the third year in a row that Simply Safe has won this honor. The case file team loves Simply Safe because they offer whole home security with advanced sensors for every room, window, and door. They even have hazard sensors that detect fires, floods, and other threats. You can be in complete control of your system all the time and from any location. And Simply Safe is super affordable with 24 7 monitoring costs under $1 per day. Don't miss your chance for massive savings on the Casefile team's favourite security system. Get 50% off any new system at simplysafe.com slash casefile today. This is their biggest discount of the year. That's simplysafe.com slash casefile. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Are you wasting money on subscriptions? 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about. Maybe for you, it's an unused Amazon Prime account or a Hulu account that never gets streamed. There's this great app that helps you keep track of all your expenses, and because of that, you'll never waste money on subscriptions you don't even use. You might have heard of it. It's called Rocket Money, formerly known as True Bill. The Rocket Money app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Because there's so many different subscriptions we can get now, it's just so much easier having a central place to manage all your accounts. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. You may even find out you've been double charged for a subscription. It's happened to people before. To cancel a subscription, all you have to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com slash casefile. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com slash casefile. Just over a year before Joe, Michelle and Christy Rogers were killed, An 18-year-old woman presented to the emergency department of a hospital outside of Wilshire. For the sake of clarity, Casefile will refer to this woman as Zoe. Zoe was in a terrified state. She reported that she had been raped at knife point on the Rogers Dairy Farm. Zoe identified her attacker as her roommate, 31-year-old John Rogers. He co-owned the dairy business with his brother, Hal. John and Zoe had been residing together in a trailer on site. As detailed in the Tampa Bay Times newspaper, John Rogers was known locally for being strange. He was an ex-Marine with a muscular build and intimidating presence. He talked about missions he had allegedly undertaken for the Secret Service and Central Intelligence Agency, better known as the CIA. The content of these stories was enough to compel locals to keep their distance. Zoe lived with John out of necessity. She desperately needed a place to stay. 
Police arrived at the Rogers farm to question John about Zoe's assault. As they spoke to John in his trailer, a detective noticed a briefcase on the floor of the living room area. John said the briefcase contained paperwork. He was asked to open it. John fiddled with the briefcase lock for a moment before saying that he had forgotten its combination. He was then handed a screwdriver and told to use it. The briefcase actually contained a videotape, five photographs and a cassette tape. The videotape featured footage of John sexually assaulting Zoe. The photographs depicted a different teenager altogether. She was naked, blindfolded and bound. The cassette tape was a recording of this young woman screaming for John Rogers to leave her alone. Detectives identified this second victim as John's niece, Michelle Rogers. When police spoke to Michelle, she broke down. She revealed that her uncle John had been sexually abusing her for almost two years, beginning when Michelle was 14 years old. She kept word of the abuse secret as John had repeatedly threatened to kill her if she spoke out. Hal and Joe Rogers had noticed their oldest daughter seemed nervous around John but thought it was due to their clashing personalities. Michelle protected her younger sister Christy by making sure she was never alone with their uncle. John was arrested in mid-February 1988 and was released on bail pending trial. Hal Rogers had put up the money that secured his brother's freedom, even though Hal's daughter was one of John's victims. Hal later explained that he had once given his word to John that he would get him out of jail no matter what. And Hal never broke promises. He did, however, make John sell his share of the dairy farm and told him never to come near his family again. The following year, John Rogers pleaded no contest for the rape of Zoe. To spare Michelle Rogers from having to testify, the charges pertaining to her assault were dropped. John ultimately received a 7 to 25 year sentence. A month after the trial, Michelle went to Florida with her mother and sister. It was hoped the change of scenery would help her move forward. She was resilient and determined to reclaim her life. John Rogers had been to Florida. He visited the state for a six-week holiday while on bail for his sex crimes. He went to many of the same locations that Joe, Michelle and Christy would come to visit a year later. John was in prison at the time of the triple homicide, leading detectives to wonder. Had he made good on his previous threats to Michelle? Could he have made connections in Florida and organised a hit? Rumours were also circulating that John was involved in a drug and pornography ring. Apparently, Joe was aware, providing another motive why John would target the Rogers women. Yet, there was no way John could have known that Joe, Michelle or Christy were in Florida. He had no visitors in prison or correspondence with the outside world. John wasn't the only Rogers family member that raised suspicions. Gossip in Wilshire spotlighted Hal Rogers due to his perceived odd behaviour in the aftermath of the murders of his wife and daughters. He didn't cry at their funeral and had taken to wearing tinted glasses. A feeling had arisen within the community that Hal was hiding something. Detectives checked Howe's bank records and discovered that he had withdrawn $7,000 shortly after his family had gone missing. Hal explained that he had intended to use the money to drive to Florida and commence a search. He said he preferred to carry cash and that he kept the $7,000 in his truck's glove compartment. 
Howe still had the money. But detectives were open to the possibility that it might have been intended as payment to someone involved in the murders. While Hal Rogers was enduring the suspicions of his local community, those who knew him well couldn't believe he was being considered a suspect. The loss of his entire family had left him a shell of a man who buried himself in farm work as a distraction. Hal willingly took part in a polygraph test. While the results couldn't be used in any legal capacity, they led police to believe he absolutely wasn't involved in the murders. They came to view Hal as another victim in the case. The Rogers case was featured in the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Bulletin. The monthly publication was sent to police departments across the state. It detailed unsolved crimes to facilitate the sharing of information to help generate leads. One Florida-based police officer was going through his paperwork four months after the killings when he came across the latest bulletin. He was aware of the Rogers case due to its notoriety, but it was another unsolved crime that caught his eye. For the sake of clarity, Casefile will refer to the woman involved as Lucy. 24-year-old Lucy was originally from Ontario in Canada. She was visiting Florida on holiday in May 1989, two weeks before Joe, Michelle and Christie's trip. On the night of Sunday the 14th, Lucy had dinner with a female friend. The pair then walked to a nearby convenience store. It was around 9.30, and as the two women walked through the car park, they passed a relatively tall and heavyset man. Despite having an imposing presence, he struck up a friendly conversation that put Lucy and her friend at ease. He introduced himself as Dave Posner. Dave warned the women to be careful, saying the crime rate in the area was high. He offered them a ride so they wouldn't have to walk the dark and dangerous streets alone. Lucy and her friend accepted and got into Dave's dark-coloured vehicle. It was a pleasant drive. At one stage, Lucy spoke of wanting to go fishing while in Florida. Dave told her that he had a powerboat and would be happy to take her out in Tampa Bay. Certain her friend would join them, Lucy made plans for the three of them to meet again the following day at 2pm. However, Lucy's friend didn't want to go. She couldn't explain why exactly, but Dave gave her the creeps. Undeterred, Lucy went without her. She met Dave as planned, and the two headed out in his blue and white boat. The water was rough in the bay, so they didn't venture far. Dave appeared disappointed that Lucy's friend didn't join them, but was otherwise upbeat. He made easy conversation, talking about his family and mentioning his job as an aluminium salesman. Four hours after they had set off, Dave dropped Lucy back off at the pier. It was 6.30pm and the pair were about to go their separate ways when Dave had an idea. He said Tampa Bay was more beautiful at sunset and offered to take Lucy and her friend out on the water in an hour's time to experience it. Lucy walked back to where she was staying and let her friend know but her friend still refused to be around Creepy Dave. When Lucy returned to the pier alone, Dave became irritated and almost angry. He collected himself and helped Lucy back on his boat. As darkness fell, Dave steered his boat out to deeper waters. Other vessels disappeared from view and Lucy felt scared. She asked Dave to take her back to shore. He refused and ordered her to sit on his lap. Lucy screamed. 
Dave responded bluntly, Do you think anyone will hear you? He then threatened to duct tape Lucy's mouth shut if she didn't stop. When he made his intentions to rape Lucy clear, she refused to give in. Is it really worth losing your life over? He asked. After raping Lucy, Dave vomited over the side of his boat. He then drove back to land, stopping every so often to vomit some more. When the boat reached shallow water, Lucy jumped out. Dave told her to watch her step, then drove away. Lucy reported the assault and helped facilitate a composite sketch of her assailant. The image depicted a balding and weathered man in his late thirties with blue eyes, short reddish brown hair and a moustache. Dave Posner managed to elude police, resulting in the publication of Lucy's case in the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Bulletin. Reading about Lucy's ordeal alongside the Rogers murders led one officer to notice the similarities between the two cases. A dark coloured vehicle was mentioned, as was a blue and white powerboat, duct tape, sexual assault. All the women were tourists and had their clothing from the waist down removed. It was believed Joe and her daughters were lured into a boat in a manner similar to that of Lucy, hence why their car was at the ramp. A behaviour analysis of the Rogers killer conducted by the FBI aligned with Dave Posner. They had described the killer as intelligent with good social skills. He was adept at making people feel at ease while presenting himself as a regular and hard-working, law-abiding citizen. His crimes would come as a surprise to those who knew him. Due to the killer's familiarity with the area and the fact he owned a boat, he most certainly lived in Tampa. The FBI believed Joe, Michelle and Christy were not his first victims and that he would strike again. Locating Dave Posner became a high priority. Detectives weighed up the risk of tracking Dave down versus the chance he'd flee if he knew they were coming for him. The crimes were too significant to take a reserved approach, so officers decided to circulate the composite sketch of Dave in local newspapers in the hopes someone would recognise him. Saturday, November 4, 1989, was five months to the day Joe, Michelle and Christy Rogers left for their fateful trip to Florida. Tampa resident Joanne Steffi was sitting at her kitchen table reading the paper. The Rogers case was being spotlighted once again as a composite sketch of a possible suspect was now available. Joanne read about the case but had to set the paper aside upon realising she was running late for an appointment. As she drove along her street, Joanne passed the home belonging to her creepy neighbour, locally known as Obi. It suddenly dawned on her. Obi resembled the suspect sketch in the Rogers homicide case. He also drove a dark coloured car and owned a blue and white powerboat. Joanne clipped the suspect sketch out of the paper and showed it to her friend and fellow neighbour, a woman named Moselle. Moselle warned Joanne not to implicate Obi unless Joanne was absolutely certain of her theory. Joanne agreed and took the clipping home where she stuck it to her fridge. It remained there until early the following year, when Joanne happened to spot Obi watching her house from the street one night. Scared of what Obi might have been capable of, Joanne spoke to a deputy sheriff who said he would look into it. Weeks passed with no news, leading Joanne to assume authorities had investigated Obi and cleared him of any involvement in the Rogers case.
Case File will be back shortly. Thank you for supporting us by listening to this episode's sponsors. If you're like us on the Case File team, 2022 has been a super busy year. We've all been working hard to bring you new episodes every week. But we don't forget to have some downtime along the way. And when team member Bridget needs a few minutes break from work, she turns to her favourite mobile game. That's right, it's Best Fiends. Best Fiends is a free-to-download mobile puzzle game with thousands of exciting levels for new adventures and challenges every time you play. There are dozens of unique fiends for you to collect, so you can customise your own team to help you defeat the menacing slugs. Bridget has cracked level 250 and is well on her way to level 300. She loves how it's a challenge to level up, but it's not so impossibly difficult that you want to stop. With heaps of in-game rewards on offer, it's easy to keep playing, and playing, even if you're offline. Download your new favourite getaway, Best Fiends, for free today on the App Store or Google Play. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Going grocery shopping is one of those things that I always put off until the last minute because I'm so busy. When it comes to buying meat, that means I don't have time to look out for good deals. If you shop like me and live in the US, you've now got one less thing to worry about. ButcherBox offers great deals on quality protein with more options than you can get at your local store. They even offer free shipping for the continental US. With ButcherBox, you can customise your box to be filled with whatever you want and you know it will contain high quality meat and seafood you can trust. Choose from 100% grass fed beef, free range organic chicken, pork raised crate free and wild caught seafood. There's a variety of box plan options and you can change your plan whenever you want. This Black Friday, ButcherBox is offering our listeners one of their best steak deals. Get two 10-ounce ribeyes free in every box for a whole year when you join. Plus an additional $10 off. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash casefile and use code casefile. That's free ribeyes for a year plus $10 off at butcherbox.com slash casefile with code casefile. Thank you for listening to this episode's ads. By supporting our sponsors, you support Casefile to continue to deliver quality content. Two years passed without any breakthroughs. In October 1991, a Florida-based police sergeant named Glenn Moore joined the team investigating the Rogers case. It was hoped a fresh pair of eyes might uncover something previously missed. Moore and the team went over all the information they had. Their attention soon turned to a brochure that was found in the Rogers family car. It was for Clearwater Beach, a popular coastal resort about 15 miles from Tampa. The brochure was found to have originated from a tourist stop near the Georgia-Florida border. Anyone linked to the brochure and distribution had already been questioned and cleared. The brochure featured handwritten directions to the Rogers Tampa-based hotel. Whoever scrawled them had a very distinct writing style. They put capital letters among the lower case and their letter Y had a uniquely long tail. This piqued Sergeant Moore's interest. The handwriting did not match Joe's, Michelle's or Christie's. Sergeant Moore pondered the likelihood that Joe and the girls got lost en route to the Days Inn and had asked someone for directions. The brochure was checked for prints, revealing a partial palm print that didn't belong to any of the three Rogers women. Sergeant Moore came up with a novel idea. He had the handwriting from the brochure printed in newspapers and posted on billboards in the Tampa area. 
it was accompanied with the message. Who wrote these directions? You may know who killed the Rogers family. A $25,000 reward was also on offer as an added incentive. Joanne Steffi saw the handwriting sample in the local paper and took it to her friend Moselle. Moselle had been listening to Joanne's worries about their neighbour Obi for some time. Obi was an aluminium salesman who had previously provided Moselle with a quote for work she wanted done to her front porch. He had written out an estimate and given her a carbon copy. Moselle searched for hours and eventually found the estimate buried among paperwork. She and Joanne compared it to the sample in the newspaper article. It was an exact match. Joanne mailed and faxed it to the local police headquarters. She then waited to hear on the news that Obi, whose real name was Oba Chandler, had been arrested in relation to the Rogers triple homicide. She heard nothing. Joanne made several follow-up calls to find out if the police could analyse the handwriting samples she had sent. She was told that the case investigators were making their way through a large amount of leads and that hers would be examined in time. June passed and by late July, Joanne was still awaiting contact from authorities. Frustrated by their lack of action, Moselle's adult daughter faxed the handwriting samples through to police again. Her accompanying message read, Here is another copy of Ober Chandler's handwriting. Many of us are convinced that his handwriting is the one published in the papers. We feel so strongly that they are one and the same that due to your lack of response, we were tempted to pursue this with a handwriting expert of our own. Following this, investigators were willing to take on the concerns of Joanne Steffi and her neighbours. Within three days, a handwriting expert confirmed that the directions on the Clearwater Beach brochure were indeed penned by Ober Chandler. It was such a close match, it was regarded as unmistakable. While this only proved that Chandler had given the Rogers women directions, it established that he had direct contact with them in the lead up to their murders. And he knew where they were staying. Yet, by the time police closed in on Ober Chandler, they were too late. He was long gone. Ober Chandler was born in Ohio, the only son in a family of five children. His father was a strict disciplinarian who took his own life. The death marked a turning point in 10-year-old Ober Chandler. The once quiet and intelligent boy became disruptive. This carried on into his adult years, during which Chandler served short stints in jail for armed robbery, drug dealing and counterfeiting. While committing a home invasion, Chandler forced the female resident to undress before restraining her to a bed. On another occasion, he bound a woman's hands and feet and covered her mouth in duct tape. By May 1988, Chandler was in the midst of his third marriage. He had eight children with multiple women. Chandler purchased a small bungalow-style home in Tampa, His blue and white powerboat was docked at the pier connected to his property and he parked his dark-coloured Jeep Cherokee in the driveway. Ober Chandler worked hard to build a good rapport with his neighbours. Then, in June 1990, he surprised them all by suddenly moving away without telling anyone. It was a year into the Rogers homicide investigation and shortly after a composite sketch of the suspect was widely publicised. The investigation into Ober Chandler was given the code name The Tin Man in reference to Chandler's work as an aluminium salesman. Detectives flew to Ontario in Canada where they spoke with Lucy, the woman who was raped aboard a boat by Dave Posner in May 1989. 
Upon viewing a photo lineup, Lucy pointed out Ober Chandler as being Dave Posner. The friend who had been travelling with Lucy at the time made the same identification. Chandler's resemblance to the composite sketch of Lucy's rapist was uncanny. Ober Chandler was tracked almost 300 miles from Tampa. He had resettled on the other side of the state in the seaside city of Daytona Beach. On Thursday, September 24, 1992, Chandler was visiting pawn shops trying to offload $750,000 worth of jewellery he had stolen. When he pulled into a gas station, officers swooped and he was placed under arrest for sexual battery. Word of his arrest spread, along with rumours that he was involved in the murders of Joe, Michelle and Christy Rogers. The news left his current neighbours in Daytona Beach stunned. He seemed like a normal guy, one neighbour told the Tampa Times newspaper. With Ober Chandler behind bars, detectives worked to see if they could implicate him in the Rogers triple homicide. They were able to recover Chandler's old blue and white powerboat, which he had sold three months after the murders. So much time had passed, nothing of significance was uncovered. Yet, one of Chandler's sisters recalled him collecting newspaper clippings about the Rogers case. When she confronted him about it, he allegedly confessed to the killings, before saying, I'm just bullshitting. On another occasion, Chandler allegedly told one of his daughters that he couldn't go back to Florida because, quote, the police are looking for me because I killed some women. Chandler had also allegedly confessed to his son-in-law, saying he threw at least one woman overboard. The evidence against Ober Chandler was circumstantial, though it was enough for a grand jury to indict him to stand a trial for the murders of Joe, Michelle and Christy Rogers in addition to his crimes against Lucy. Chandler entered a not guilty plea. The trial commenced in September 1994. Ober Chandler appeared in court wearing a casual shirt and khaki pants and flashing a broad smile. He was impassive throughout proceedings, but would become jovial with his defence team during breaks. The prosecution relied on similar fact evidence in the rape case of Canadian tourist Lucy to show that both crimes were linked. The assistant state attorney argued that the boat was the perfect place for Chandler to commit his crimes, saying, It could be committed in darkness and without the possibility of escape. Chandler's defence team put forth that acts between their client and Lucy were consensual. While they admitted that things got out of hand in that instance, they stressed that this didn't mean their client was a triple murderer. He didn't do it. It's that simple, they maintained. They painted Chandler as a helpful man who had only offered the Rogers women directions. That simple act of kindness had now spiralled into wild and baseless accusations. Three men who spent time remanded with Ober Chandler were called to testify. One said that Chandler had told him the only reason he hadn't killed the Canadian tourist was because her friend back on shore would recognise him. Another testified that Chandler had told him that his biggest mistake was leaving the note in the car. Chandler had allegedly told another inmate that the last words he spoke to the Rogers women before throwing them overboard was to, quote, swim for it. When it was looking likely that the jury would not find in Ober Chandler's favour, the defence threw a curveball. They argued that the sexual battery charge should be dropped as Lucy couldn't pinpoint exactly where the alleged rape had taken place. If it occurred more than nine nautical miles off the coast, it was outside of US jurisdiction. 
This meant the prosecution would also lose their similar fact evidence tying Lucy's case to the Rogers. In response, the prosecution reiterated key details in Lucy's statement. Specifically, she saw people on the shore and heard a bell ringing from the mainland. This meant Chandler's boat must have been only around a mile offshore. The defence then sought to implicate John Rogers in the murders, given his previous sex offences against his niece Michelle Rogers. The defence floated the long since disregarded hitman theory to explain how John could pull off the crimes. This prompted the judge to respond, You are not getting into John Rogers. John Rogers is a red herring. That is a moot issue. The executive assistant state attorney labelled the hitman theory as idiotic. Ober Chandler took the stand in his own defence, but when asked about his involvement in the rape of Lucy, he pleaded the fifth, the right to avoid answering questions in court when the answers may self-incriminate. He then snapped that it had nothing to do with Roger's case. Records showed that Chandler had made three phone calls from his boat between 1 and 2am the night of the murders. He made another two shortly before 10am. Chandler testified that he had been out fishing and wound up stranded overnight because his boat's fuel tank sprung a leak and emptied. He flagged down a Coast Guard vessel the following morning, but they were unable to assist as they were en route to an urgent job. Another boat eventually towed Chandler to shore. A member of the Tampa Bay Coast Guard told the court that none of their vessels were in the bay at the time Chandler asserted. Logbooks confirmed that they hadn't been called to any jobs that morning. Furthermore, a marine patrol expert established that Chandler's boat couldn't have leaked all of its fuel. An anti-siphon valve prevented this from happening. When the prosecution asked if he had killed the Rogers family, Chandler responded, I have never killed no one in my whole life. It's ludicrous. It's ridiculous. The jury only needed five minutes to reach their unanimous verdict. For the first degree murders of Joe, Michelle and Christy Rogers, Ober Chandler was found guilty. Given this result, the lesser sexual battery charge against him was dropped. During sentencing, the presiding judge said, One victim was first. Two watched. Imagine the fear. One victim was second. One watched. Imagine the horror. Finally, the last victim, who had seen the other two disappear over the side, was lifted up and thrown overboard. Imagine the terror. Ober Chandler, you have not only forfeited your right to live among us, but under the laws of the state of Florida, you have forfeited your right to live at all. May God have mercy on your soul. Ober Chandler was sentenced to death. A juror later told the Tampa Bay Times, He had a smirk. I just wanted to walk over there and slap it off his face. During his 17 years on death row, Ober Chandler never expressed remorse for his crimes. No one visited him in prison and attempts to appeal his verdict failed. He was put to death by lethal injection in November 2011. He was 64 years old. In late 1990, 20-year-old Ivelisse Berrios Begaris was working at a sports store in the city of Coral Springs, Florida. On the evening of Monday, November 26, Ivelisse finished a shift and left the mall where her store was located with several of her co-workers. It was just after 10pm when the group farewelled each other in the parking lot. Ivelisse then headed off to her car alone. 
When Ivelisse failed to return home, her husband headed to the shopping mall. He spotted Ivelisse's car in the nearly empty lot. She was nowhere to be found. The two tyres on the passenger side of Ivelisse's car were found to have been slashed. Three hours later, Ivelisse's body was found lying naked under the letterbox of a residential house approximately two and a half miles from the mall. She had been strangled to death. Her wrists and ankles featured ligature marks and there was brown packing tape stuck in her hair. An extensive investigation failed to uncover Ivelisse's killer and her case went cold. Ivelisse's body had been swabbed for traces of foreign DNA, but it took 23 years before forensic testing had reached the point where anything significant could be uncovered from the samples. In 2013, cold case detectives had the swabs re-examined using advanced techniques. DNA was lifted from traces of semen. They matched an existing profile on the state's criminal database. Ivelisse Berrios Begarese's killer was Ober Chandler. At the time of Ivelisse's murder, Chandler lived less than two miles from the mall where she worked. Chandler abruptly moved away days after the slaying. He was in such a haste he left all his furniture behind. One of the detectives fronting Ivelisse's cold case told CBS News, It was a case that people were very afraid of, and now, finding out years later who the suspect was, they had every right to be afraid. By the time Ober Chandler was identified as Ivelisse's killer, he had been dead for three years. If not for Chandler's execution, Authorities have said that he would have been charged with Ivelisse's murder. Ivelisse Berrios Begarese was murdered one and a half years after Joe, Michelle and Christy Rogers. He had indeed struck again. Hal Rogers struggled in the years following his family's murders. As detailed in the Pulitzer Prize-winning article Angels and Demons by Thomas French, Hal couldn't bring himself to clear his home of Joe, Michelle and Christie's belongings. He kept their rooms the same as when they had left for Florida. For a time, he lived in denial, often speaking about his wife and daughters in present tense while believing they would come home at any time. At one point, Hal drove to the cemetery with a shovel intending to dig up their graves just so he could confirm they were really in there. He reached the cemetery only to turn around and head straight back home. A year after the murders, Hal rode his motorbike to a long flat stretch of highway with no traffic. He accelerated until the speedometer reached 100 miles an hour. He then closed his eyes and took his hands off the handlebars. When Hal reopened his eyes, he was lying on the side of the road with his motorbike on the ground nearby. Hal was uninjured. He took this as a sign that Joe, Michelle and Christy were watching over him and weren't ready for him to join them. Hal dusted himself off got back on his bike and rode home. In 2004, Olivia Newton-John and her handsome cameraman boyfriend seemed to be madly in love with each other. But less than a year later, this seemingly besotted couple had split. And then, quite suddenly, Patrick McDermott vanished. 
His disappearance was so sudden, so total, and so mysterious that some people think he faked his own death. So here's a guy that's poor, okay, that's hurting, owes back child support. And I believe that the pressures of that and the pressures of, oh my God, I'm going to have to go to jail and my son's going to have to see me in jail. And I think it was just too much for him. Months after he vanished, alleged sightings began. Apparently, McDermott was in Mexico. And I was sitting there at the bar having adult beverages. And this guy was walking around going table to table with like an artist's rendering of an image of Patrick. And he came to our table and he goes, do you recognize this person? And I go, you know what? I think he's staying at my surf camp. In season one of Suicide, we brought you nine different stories of death fraud through the ages. Now, in season two, we're investigating the disappearance of one man, Patrick McDermott. So I'm interested to give you a question, too, because you said that you were doing an an article there or a journalism piece on people who had faked their death. Like, do you really think that Patrick McDermott faked his death? Join me, Poppy Damon. And me, Alice Fines, As we unravel the mystery week by week in Suicide. Only on Spotify. You're like, where is he? And that's horrible for somebody that that you know you cared about. Where is he? That's suicide beginning with a P. Only on Spotify. 48-year-old cameraman Patrick McDermott was the on-and-off boyfriend of Olivia Newton-John. In 2005, he boarded an overnight fishing charter off the coast of Los Angeles. When the boat disembarked the following day... Patrick was nowhere to be seen. In season two of Suicide, Poppy Damon and Alice Fines dig deeper into Patrick McDermott's case than anyone has before to answer the question, did Patrick die at sea or did he disappear deliberately to begin a new life? Suicide season two is out now, available for free only on Spotify. Spotify.